incredibly glad you joined us here today at Church of the Rock. If this is your first time, let me encourage you to go to JesusOfTheRock.org. Then you can check out our latest blog posts, you can look at our latest podcasts, or you can give to our ministries financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Now, as you go through this message, I pray that God works life change into your life and welcome to Church on the Rock. If you have your Bibles, turn to James chapter 5 tonight. Um, this message started about five or six years ago, and I, I shared a little bit of it back then. But some of you, most of you probably remember Pastor Jerry Jacobson. Pastor Jerry, was he was on staff with us for several years and attended here for uh, quite a while. He did most of our hospital visits, and he would fill in and preach for me some. It was just, uh, he and I got to be really, really good friends and close when he was here. And so when we had time off, we would go play golf together. And uh, I found out something about Jerry on the golf course that I didn't find out in church. You can find out some things about people outside of church that you don't find out in church. And I found out Jerry Jacobson was very competitive. He didn't like to lose. Now me, I did like to win. So it was kind of like an irresistible force meeting an immovable object. So we had some very uh, high tense golf games out there. I mean, we played to win, you know, and it was there was no no stakes there, just. Uh, I think he would always say this is for the uh, championship of the world. But I also found out he was sneaky. Because <laughs> I would get a couple of strokes up on him, get, start start pulling away and get a little bit ahead. And Jared knew something about me. He knew the one thing I enjoyed about more as much or more than playing golf was preaching and talking about the Bible and talking about, you know, the different scriptures and things, and he knew that. And he started using it against me. It took me a while to catch on. But I would be, you know, trying to line up this putt, you know, and, and get ready to make this shot, and then all of a sudden Jerry would say, you know, I was reading this morning over in Proverbs about such and such and such and such. What do you think? And I would look at him, and I'd think, I think I want to make this putt. I'm going to need you to calm down, you know, after I finally caught up. But he knew me, though, and, and, and he knew that for the next few holes, I'm going to start thinking about what he said. And sure enough, it would work because, I mean, it would get me off my game because I'm thinking about that. And we were playing one day, and, and it was the same situation. And he said, you know, I mean, I'm getting ready to hit a shot. He said, you know, he said, I was praying this morning, and I started thinking, you know, I believe we're fixing to see miracles and healings like we haven't seen in a long time. He said, but here's what I believe the Lord showed me. I believe the Lord showed me that we're not going to see them, but when we're laying hands on people and anointing them, we're going to see these miracles when we get in our prayer closet. What do you think? <laughs> and I said, I think I want to make this point. Now, I... But the more I thought about it, the more I started really pondering and feeding on what he had said. And so I, I shared a little bit, I think, back then about this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a little bit more tonight on what Pastor Jerry said to me that day and what I think um, that, that the Holy Spirit has sort of led me in that direction. If you read uh, over the book of James, a real popular verse of scriptures in James 5, and verse 13, uh, the New Living Translation reads like this, Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And if you've committed any sins, you'll be forgiven. And so we've sort of claimed that, that prayer. When somebody comes and says, hey, I'm sick, would you pray for me? Oftentimes, we'll grab some of our elders, we'll grab some ministers, some of our prayer warriors, and we'll bring them up here, and 
we'll take this oil and we'll anoint them with oil. There's nothing special or magical about this oil. The only thing special about it is it's in obedience to what the scripture says. Let the elders of the church anoint them with oil and the prayer of faith will save the sick. And so we've sort of always done that. And yet, I would find that we've seen God work some unusual miracles. We've seen God heal people miraculously, praying for them, and they come back the next week and they say, you know, I'm well, God just did something. I went home that night and did this, you know, and so we've seen God do it. But I've also seen a lot of times it seemed like nothing happened. But God, they were sick. They called for the elders. We anointed them with all. We prayed the prayer of faith, and nothing happened. And I would just like to understand why. Now, I know I've had so many people tell me over the years, now, I know we're not supposed to question God. I know we're not supposed to ask why. Ours is not to question why. And every time somebody tells me that, I ask them, could you please show me where it says that in Scripture? Because I've never found that. I've never even found anything that alluded to we're not supposed to question God or ask God why. Nothing even close. I know that we're told this. He said, ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be opened unto you. I've I, I read that in the Bible. I know that, that he says, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness for they'll be filled. Uh, you know, I know that I know the Bible says if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and doesn't hold back from anyone. If you wonder something, ask. He said, if you, if, you know, you have not because you ask not. It's no wonder we walk in this because everybody says, I know I'm not supposed to question. I know why not. I find that's how I acquire knowledge. That's how I get wisdom by asking the teacher questions. I'm not afraid to say, tell me why. I want to understand this. I need wisdom. I need directions. So I want to know why. I ask God why questions almost every day. And so I remember I started asking God why. Why aren't the sick being healed? Why is the prayer of faith raising them up? Why, why aren't the elders anointed, faith-filled prayers working every time? I just asked. And I believe the Holy Spirit led me back to the book of James, which, by the way, is a fascinating little book. You can read it in about seven or eight minutes. And I believe I found some of the answers in, in this book. Now, one of, one of the things uh, it says in here is that you have not because you ask not. And when you do ask, you ask amiss, King James says. Most translations say when you do ask, you ask wrong. You ask selfishly. You ask with the wrong motives. You ask, you ask, you don't ask correctly. So that's one thing. I think we need to check our motives and our heart when we're praying and when we're asking. I think we need to say, look, why am I asking for this? Am I asking to do this because I want to see a miracle? Am I asking this because I want to be known as somebody that can lay hands on the sick? Am I doing this to glorify myself or to glorify God? Why? He said, well, sometimes when you ask, you just ask wrong. You asked wrong. But I kept thinking there's more here. And so I kept reading. I read the book of James. And when I got through, I went back and read it again. And I got through it. I went back and read it again. And just, just in the last couple of days, I've read it uh, over again a few more times. And, and, and I'm saying, you know, why? I begin to see some things in the book of James. Why I think calling for the elders of the church and having them anoint with oil and pray the prayer of faith. Why sometimes it may not be working. You say, what things? I don't know. Some of this is Rogerism. Some of this is just, this is my, this is my theory. But I started to think, 
What if the problem could be with the elders themselves? What if the problem is with the ministers themselves, the prayer warriors themselves, the people who are laying hands on on these people? He says, you call for the elders of the church, the leaders of the church, the prayer warriors in the church. You call for them and you ask them to anoint you with oil and pray and the prayer of faith will heal the sick. And so I I kept coming across verses uh, like all of these are in the book of James. Chapter 5, verse 9, it says this. Grudge not one against another brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge stands before the door. Hey, elders of the church. Hey, church leadership. Hey, prayer warriors. Stop holding grudges against each other. The judge is standing at the door. The judge is standing at the door. Now let it go. Stop holding grudges against me. How many times do we come together and we're praying for people and we're going and we got grudges against somebody? We got a grudge in our heart. Guess what? The judge is standing at the door. I read... Things in chapter 4, verse 10. He said, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And he'll lift you up. How many times do we get proud? And we allow pride to slip into our life. He said, humble yourself. Verse 11 of that same chapter says, don't speak evil one of another, brethren. He that speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother... Speaks evil of the law of God. What are you saying about your brothers, your sisters? He says, when you speak evil about your brothers and your sisters, you're speaking evil about the law of God. God himself. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't go talking and trash about somebody and then coming and asking God to heal the sick and raise them up. You're going to pray for people. He's saying, you set yourself aside, you sanctify yourself, you get yourself ready to pray for somebody. Verse 8 says, draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. What you doing out praying for the sick, anointing somebody with all? You got this stuff in your heart against somebody else? You, you got this right, you got pride, you got grudges, you're talking about other people, and you're expecting me to use you to heal somebody? Verse 3 says, You you ask and receive not because you ask amiss, or you ask for selfish reasons. Chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be patient and establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The judge is at the door. The coming of the Lord draweth nigh. How serious are we about praying? How important is prayer to us? I don't know, it just seems to me that there's a whole lot of verses surrounding that verse that says, is any sick among you, let them call for the elders of the church, and the elders of the church shall anoint him with oil, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. We, we, we get that one, but there's a whole lot around there that says that the elders of the church, the ministers, the prayer warriors, you better get your heart right with God. You need to cleanse yourself. You need to be an example. You need to be, you need to be eldering and leading and ministering and, and living and being the example and setting the bar for the rest of the body. So, so I just I started wondering, you know, if we were eldering and we were ministering and we were leading and we were living the way we should be, if we wouldn't be laying our hands on the sick and anointing them with oil and seeing a prayer of faith heal the sick a lot more often. I don't know. I love how James closes his book. In the last three verses, he writes this. He says, Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you might be healed. For the effectual, fervent prayer 
of a righteous person avails much. In other words, it works. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, a person that's right with God, not somebody that's mealy mouthed and talking about somebody and got stuff in your heart against somebody. And then he gives us an example. He says, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. In other words, he went through the same stuff we go through. He was tempted just like we're tempted. He went through the same issues we went through. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. And yet, he earnestly prayed there would be no rain on the earth for three years and six months. And there wasn't. And then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth the fruit. See, sometimes we read that and we think, well, Elijah prayed the rain would stop. And then, you know, almost sort of the next day he prayed and it would rain. think, well, I can do that, you know, just watch the weather. And I pray, Lord, don't let it rain today. And tomorrow, Lord, we need some rain. No, no, this was three and a half years. Lots of things happened during that three and a half years. I don't have time to go into them tonight, but a lot of things happened during that three and a half years. And through everything that happened, Elijah stayed faithful. He made the right choices. He did the right things. He stayed a, a, a righteous man. And so when he prayed for the rain to come forth, the rain came forth. I know one of the greatest temptations that comes to an elder, a minister, a leader, a prayer warrior is that sin of pride. Especially when your prayers are working. Pride really creeps in then. When people are flocking to you and asking you, could you anoint me with oil? When people are coming from all over, from, from, from different cities and saying, I know God is using you. God can use you to lay hands on me. Would you anoint me with oil and pray? And sometimes we kind of, it's easy to get a little bit puffed up in it. We kind of say, when it works, we say, look at these hands. <laughs> I'll lay these hands. When it don't work, we say, it's your faith. You need more faith. But if it works, it's look at the, you know. Look at these hands. And that, 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 that sin that got Lucifer kicked out of heaven, the sin of pride starts creeping in. That old, old sin. And pretty soon we get puffed up. Suddenly we're getting the glory for what God's doing. And God has already said, I won't share my glory with any man. And one problem I see today, many times, we're not just wanting him to share his glory, we're robbing him of his glory. Let me throw out a couple of quick scriptures to you. We'll, we'll wind up. But I just, I think this thing is just, has such far-reaching implications. If we purify our hearts before the Lord and pray rightly, pray correctly, I just believe that we're going to see God move. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25 Listen to this. It says, This foolish plan of God's is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness, as if he had any, God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things that the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and he used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy. He freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. If you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. Chapter 3, turn the page, verse 18. He says, stop deceiving yourselves. 
If you think you're wise by this world's standards, you need to become a fool to truly be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. As the scriptures say, he traps the wise in the snare of their own cleverness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise. He knows they are worthless. So don't boast about following a particular human leader. For everything belongs to you, whether Paul or Apollos or Peter or the world or life or death or present or future. Everything belongs to you and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. It's not about anybody's hands. It's not about anybody's gift. It's not about anybody. It's about obedience. It's about Christ. None of us can do anything without Christ. He says, don't don't be looking at at some human being, even if it's Paul or Apollos or Peter. He says, it's not them. It all belongs to you, and you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. One last scripture in Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Let me give you this one real quick. Verse number 20 through 24. Now listen to this. Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and so they sent a delegation to make peace with him because their cities were dependent upon Herod's country for food. The delegates won the support of Blastus, Herod's personal assistant, and an appointment with Herod was granted. When the day arrived, Herod put on his royal robes, sat on his throne, and made a great speech to them. I think I got into this because I've been watching so many debates. <laughs> put on his royal robes, sat on his throne, and made a speech to them. The people gave him a great ovation, shouting, It is the voice of a God, not a man. That's the voice of a God, not a man. Instantly, the angel of the Lord struck Herod with a sickness because he accepted the people's worship instead of giving the glory to God. So he was consumed with worms and died. The Bible said it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. God said, I want to share my glory with anyone. He sat down in his royal robes on his throne, began to speak his words of wisdom, and they said, oh, that's not just a man, that's a voice of God. And it said, because he accepted their worship, he died. He was eaten with worms. Didn't look so godlike anymore. So I don't know. I gave Jerry a quarter, told him I was going to preach this sermon. That way he couldn't say I stole it from him. <laughs> but I believe he was on to something. I believe that we're going to see healings and miracles, not necessarily by the laying on of hands in public prayer, but I believe we're going to see miracles by getting in our prayer closet. And seeking God. I don't know all the mysteries of God concerning healing, why some are, why some are not. I don't know. Brother Jerry didn't know. Benny Hinn doesn't know. <coughs> Kenneth Copeland doesn't know. T.D. Jakes doesn't know. Joel Osteen doesn't know. Joyce Meyer doesn't know. Because these mysteries belong to God. He said, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. For as the heavens are far above the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts so far above yours. And sometimes when you're asking, you don't even know what you're asking for. Sometimes when you ask me and I don't do it, I'm saving you from things you don't even know anything about. (coughs) But I do believe God will give us a glimpse. And I think Jerry got a glimpse. And when he shared it with me and I prayed about it, I think I got a glimpse. I'm going to close with one last scripture, Matthew chapter 6. Now, understand, we're not going to stop anointing people with oil. People say we're sick. We want you to pray for us. We're going to anoint them with oil. We're going to pray the prayer of faith. But I think...
before we do that, we need to spend time in our prayer closet. We need to spend time with God. We need to be right with God when we pray for other people. We need to be living examples, and I mean the whole body. We need to be living examples so that we're ready to minister to other people. So that other people will say to us, Sunday's my favorite day of the week. Because when I go in there, there's something different. There's something different. The people are right with God. Listen to this verse of Scripture, Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 says, But when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners, in the synagogues, where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they'll ever get. Enjoy it, because that's all you're going to get. People clap and call your name. Enjoy it, because that's all you're going to get. He says, but when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you. Pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on, as some people have other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask. Pray like this. Our Father, in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth. As it is in heaven. That should be our prayer. God, we want your will to be done on earth. We want your will to be done at Church on the Rock. Like it is in heaven. We want to create what you're doing in heaven here on earth. We want to be those vessels that you can use to take what's going on in heaven. And let us have a piece of that here. And he says, that's what I'm looking for. But to do that, you got to get rid of these petty grudges you're holding against each other. you got to quit running your mouth talking about other people. you got to get rid of the pride that's doing it. you got to get your heart right with God in your prayer closet. And then when you come and you lay hands, I'll heal the sick. Paul, Paul said one time, talking about speaking in tongues. And they, Paul said, I'd rather speak five words to you in my own tongue than a thousand in unknown tongues. And yet then he says, in another place he says, I would that you all speak with tongues like I do. So it's like, what is he saying? Then he says, I'd rather speak five words in my, in, in my own. And I think what Paul's saying is this, if I can get along with God and I can pray in the Spirit, just me and God in my prayer closet, I, I can walk out there and speak five words that will blow you away. Five words, just I can just speak a little bit and, and, you, and it'll, it'll move mountains. It'll change your life. But I gotta first have my life right. I've gotta first spend my time with God. So then when I come out publicly, God's going to move. God's going to move. So let's purpose in our heart. And this is not just what we call the elder board or the pastor. This is the body. This is all of us. We are the body of Christ. I want us all to live our lives in such a way that our neighbors and our coworkers are saying, man, I want to go there Sunday. I want to go there Sunday. I want Sunday to be the best day in people's week when they come to church because there's something different here. Amen. Again, we're so incredibly glad you joined us here today at Church on the Rock. Now, if this message encouraged you in any way, let me encourage you to go to JesusTheRock.org and let us know about it. Those type of messages encourage us as we work throughout the week. While you're there, check out our latest podcast or give to our ministries financially by clicking on the giving button at the top right-hand corner of the screen. Again, thank you for joining us today and have a blessed week.